to over here. Yeah. Okay, thank we leave it at that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for running up all the uh, late night action overnight. Uh, let's uh, take that discussion forward with David Manson, who's uh, founder and CIO at the Manson uh, Group. Uh, joining us live from New York City, the company has an AUM of $3.4 billion. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, David, boy in. How, how, I mean, what did you make of the sell-off yesterday and does it have more legs? Well, I would certainly think that historically the Nasdaq going down six, seven, eight percent should not be considered the end of a sell-off. Um, of course, the mother of them all dropped seventy percent in March of two thousand and didn't make a new high for sixteen years. But um, in this case, I don't believe we're facing something so dramatic. But I don't think a high single-digit drop even counts when you have a. Uh, about 50% of the index trading at utterly ridiculous valuations. So the idea of it dropping 15, 20% wouldn't surprise me at all. And nor do I think it's as connected to the 10 year yield as many investors and commentators are talking. It's certainly one of the factors in, in uh, catalyzing a repricing, but it doesn't need a catalyst to reprice. When you get to nosebleed valuations, Sometimes things simply have to correct. So this is your classic buy the dip kind of fall? I do not think it's a buy the dip. I think that the valuations are so disconnected from fundamentals in some of these high tech, high growth, high PE names that I would not be buying just simply because it's at a lower price than it was a couple of weeks ago. I think that you need a real, and this is where I think a lot of investors are spoiled by the nature of markets for some time now, that we look at 5% moves as something meaningful. Uh, markets correcting 10 to 15% for no reason is quite common throughout history. And in this case, it's doing so in the NASDAQ from nosebleed valuations not seen since 1999. So essentially, David, what you're saying, this is the much due correction that everybody is waiting for. What do you advise investors to do then if they have money in the market? Well, the one thing I need to be very honest about is that I have been thinking the Nasdaq was due for a correction for quite some time and it continued to go higher. The good news for people invested in the Nasdaq is that they continue to get higher prices. The bad news when corrections don't come is that when they do come, and they have to correct from a higher level, it tends to make things a bit more violent. Um, we happen to be dividend growth investors at my firm. We're very focused on strong balance sheets, definable free cash flow, and reasonable valuations off of that free cash flow where money is shared with investors. So we view a good portion of that cool tech, hot tech type of space as uninvestable anyways. Mm. As part of your investment strategy, how do you factor in a rising inflation? Well, we certainly believe that companies that have pricing power that are able to increase prices throughout inflationary moments and then increase what they're sharing with shareholders. Historically, I have never seen anything that's been a better investment defense against inflation than those dividend growth type names. You look at a company like McDonald's, uh, Pepsi, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Procter Gamble, if they're not raising prices, there is no inflation. So they are textbook cases of companies that are rewarding shareholders throughout inflationary periods. We think those make a lot more sense than buying a tech company at 70 times earnings or a tech company that doesn't have any earnings. Okay, so let's talk stocks then, uh, David, and get your sense on the big deal that happened overnight. Microsoft uh, went down 2%, but Activision obviously soared. Uh, despite regulatory hurdles, makes sense going uh, the metaverse way, in a, in a way competing with Facebook, but of course in a different, in a different product category. Uh, no, it is just a completely ridiculous transaction, and yet... Um, I very much understand why Microsoft's doing it. They generate so much free cash flow, and as their stock prices increased dramatically with an incredibly successful move into cloud over the last decade, uh, they have not increased their payment back to shareholders, the capital they've returned to shareholders uh, proportionately. So it leaves them with a glut of extra cash, and when corporate uh, when the C-suite of American Fortune 100 companies 
get their hands on that kind of extra cash that, that they refuse to return to shareholders, they almost always do really dumb M&A with it. Now, Activision's a fine company, but you're going to go pay 24, 25 times earnings for a company that has flat earnings over the last five years, up and down each year, but over a five-year period, flat earnings. I thought we pay a high P.E. for the growth of those earnings. Mm. The balance sheet is riddled with intangibles. It's mostly goodwill around their intellectual property. Um, If anybody can monetize this, it's probably Microsoft, but it's a very risky transaction, and they're paying up at the latest part of the cycle for it. So we would view it as evidence as to why companies need to be more shareholder friendly and returning cash to shareholders. Right, and fi- and it's interesting where you're coming from on this one because the total cash on Microsoft's book is uh, about 144 billion dollars. So I get where you're coming from, and they're saying that they're actually shelling out nearly 70 billion dollars for this acquisition. Some of your other stock picks are all tech. Walk us through those. Some of my other uh, companies. Yeah, Intel, Cisco, IBM. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, and these are examples of companies that, again, are much more shareholder friendly in terms of returning cash to shareholders. Um, they don't have the high growth um, success of the last five years that Microsoft has had. And so I definitely want to acknowledge that Microsoft has executed extremely well with cloud. They overpaid for LinkedIn, and time will tell if they pay if that pays off or not. But what you see with Intel, Cisco, and IBM are more of value stocks. They're at a very low valuation, in Intel's case, 10 or 11 times earnings. And the question is whether or not they execute out of it. They have old line businesses kicking off a ton of cash, Mm -hmm. and they have great balance sheets, but then they need a growth catalyst. And I think that each one of those respective companies has an opportunity to get a really great valuation increase as they reprice around growth that right now the market is not giving them any credit for. Mm, great insights, David. Thank you so much for your time. Stay safe in the meantime. David Bonson Thank of you. the Bonson Group. Well, we've been-